experiences matter. Uh, experiences shape us. They cause us to grow and change. They propel us. And if you think about it, these experiences are the real content of life. We quickly forget the rest. And if you didn't know, we're all in the business of experience design whether it's your uh, products and design and development or uh, training and education, marketing, or your own personal experience, we're all creating experiences that matter. Now, I work in the field of software product and development, like Chris said, and I've been designing product experiences for almost 20 years. And one of the things I can tell you is that oftentimes the difference between success or failure is your ability to deliver an engaging experience. Let me share a story from my world. A few years ago, a company contacted us wanting help troubleshooting an experience they were uh, working with. See, they had a simple uh, goal in mind. They wanted to cure Alzheimer's. Um, and what they did was they, they were sort of a feeder system. They found people who wanted to participate in clinical trials and they matched them up with appropriate clinical trials. Now, one of the greatest challenges in finding a cure is actually recruiting these participants. I was shocked to learn that there were more treatments and therapies available to be tested than there are participants. In 2016, it took nearly 7 million people to produce 4,500 participants. That, that's shocking. And um, they wanted some help figuring out what was going on. Why were so many people dropping out? Well, when we got into the process, what we discovered was it was long and it was difficult and it was demotivating. And although people said they wanted to uh, be part of a clinical trial, they quickly sort of lost interest, became disengaged, and eventually dropped out. Now, that, that puzzled me and it got me thinking and asking the question, how do we create meaningful experiences for others? How do we create experiences that help people accomplish a goal that they have? And I'll have to tell you, for me, I had an unlikely teacher in this area, video games. So for all of you who had moms who said video games would never help you in life, you can tell her she was wrong. Um, and so t video games do a lot of uh, things to create engaging experiences. I want to talk about three of those today that I think are relevant. And I want to do so by using probably the world's current most popular video game, Fortnite. Now, if you don't know what Fortnite is or have never played, Fortnite is a game where you are one of 100 players and you get dropped on an ever-shrinking island with one goal in mind, survive. And in the end, there's one winner, one person who earns earns the victory royale. Now, if you're not actually familiar with playing the game, you may be familiar with this. And that's the Fortnite dances. These went viral all on their own. In fact, NFL players even started copying Fortnite dances for a while. Now, as I was preparing for this talk, I asked both my boys if I should attempt to do a Fortnite dance up here, and I was met with a resounding no. <laughs> yeah. And which is probably good. I wouldn't want to be the first TED presenter that like pulls a hamstring during a TED talk. Chase and I, uh, this is my youngest son, Chase, and um, I grew up playing video games, and one of the things that, that I've enjoyed even more is being able to share that experience with my two boys. Chase is 12, and when he was 10, we started playing Fortnite together. And we would take turns seeing who could survive the longest. No surprise who was better at the game. Um, Chase would take a, what he called a try-hard approach. Um, he would go, like a lot of kids, into the most highly contested areas, conflicts, run in, no fear, and, um, and, and do pretty well. I, on the other hand, would take a different approach when my kids often f poked fun at. I like to hide in bushes, sneaking around, trying not to be seen. Um, it's known as being a bush wookie. Uh, it's not the most effective, but, but we still have fun. Now, game designers understand that people will play the game differently. They don't try to segment users um, the way we traditionally do. See, Chase and I sometimes will play to win. Sometimes we just enjoy exploring the island. And in fact, at one point in time, there was even a golf course on the island you could play. Um, game designers understand that the behaviors 
uh, when people are playing are what separate their users. So for instance, they don't use traditional demographics. They might look at and say, there's a tryhard group, or there's a Bushwicky group, or there's an explorer or a collaborator. And I might be any one of those, depending on the game. They use these to, um, to facilitate this, this ability for players to create their own path, choose your own path. Then they know by choosing their own path and not forcing everyone down the same, same narrow path that it leads to a feeling of autonomy. And that autonomy ultimately produces intrinsic motivation or increased motivation. And if you're trying to build an engaging experience, motivated players or users are a big key. So the first lesson is you need to understand your players and why they're playing. Whether your world looks like Fortnite or not, understanding who's, who's engaging with your experience and why is key. Now, Chase and I discovered uh, these things called daily challenges. Imagine a, like a task list in the game of things to do. A lot of times they were sort of almost like puzzles. And these sort of really started to change the way Chase and I interacted with Fortnite. I remember one that required you to visit a fox, a crab, and a llama all in a single game. Now, the interesting thing about this is one of those was a huge wooden structure that you could actually climb into like a building. One was a statue in one of the town squares, and one of them was a painting in a house somewhere on the map. It was a little bit of a challenge to sort of figure out where they were. And so Chase every day would get up, run downstairs to the Xbox, see what the daily challenges were before school. And then on the way to school, we would talk about how we would, how we would try to solve these. Like, where, where do you think that is? Where, 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 what are we going to do? And when I got home, he was eager to jump in and start playing. I recognize this pattern as a, as, a, as a model that oftentimes games use. And it says for a behavior to occur, three things have to be present. First, motivation. How much do you want to do it? And the second one is ability, how easy it is to do. The harder it is to do, the more motivated someone has to be, and the easier it is to do, the less motivation is required. Games do a masterful job of blending these two things together making sure that the challenge and skill for the players always match up so you don't end up bored or frustrated. But there's a third component, and this one's the one that's most often, I think, forgotten or left out, and it's something called a trigger. It's what reminds you to perform the activity in the first place. And game designers use this concept to build something called engagement loops. It starts with a trigger that leads to an activity, followed by some reward. And that reward hopefully is encouraging or inspiring enough that would lead you to pursue the trigger a second, or a loop a second time. So for instance, the, the um, daily challenges, you know, Chase would get up, run downstairs. That was the trigger to check them out. In the car, we would talk about what they were. And the reward was some sort of some motivation or some um, intrinsic piece that, that satisfaction of like thinking we had solved it. When I got home, that was another trigger, which led to us running down and playing and earning more achievements in the game. And this combination of that, the more loops you do, the more times you could repeat this, the higher level of engagement is with your experience. Now, this is a powerful concept you can apply to your own life. Think of a behavior or something you would like to change in your life. Maybe it's exercise more regularly, right? I would challenge you to ask these three questions, like, what's my motivation? How motivated I am to do that? And how easy is it, is it to do? Could I make it easier, take less time, less money, less energy, less brain cycles? And then finally, that critical component, what's the trigger? What is it that's going to remind you to do that? Is it a reminder on your phone, a friend, something? If the behavior is not occurring, it's often because one of these three things are, are missing. And if we're going to build engaging experiences, if we're going to build experiences that help people reach their goals, we need to create engagement loops to fuel that cycle. Which brings me to my last point that I first learned about in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And he talks about this concepts of peaks or peak moments. If you know anything about Fortnite, they recently created one of these peak moments with their Black Hole Chapter 2 event. And it literally got coverage in virtually every paper across the globe. Now today, I'd like to talk about an experience that's a little more memorable to me. But first, to clarify, what do I mean by these peak experiences? 
Have you ever had that, that feeling of like wanting to pull out your camera and capture this moment? That moment of, I want to remember this? That, that's a key that you're experiencing sort of one of these, these peak moments. So recently, my family and I visited um, Harry Potter World in Orlando, Florida, and Universal Studios had just released this new ride. Um, and we were all excited to ride, although the first couple of days, the lines were like two and a half and three and a half hours long, which is entirely too long for me to wait in any line. So uh, we sort of passed. And then on the final day, um, Chase was determined to ride. And so we got to the park an hour early, waited in line to get in, and it was a pretty orderly sort of uh, situation. They were doing a pretty good job. But as it got closer to the park opening, and I turned around and looked behind me, the crowds were piling up, right? It was starting to be somewhat of a chaotic situation, and for the first time, I feared not dying on the ride, but died getting to the ride. <laughs> like, the idea of getting trampled was real. Well, when the, they finally dropped the ropes and let everybody in, as you can imagine, it was a mad dash for the ride. And somehow in the midst of it all, we lost Chase. Like, I don't know where he went. I don't know what happened. He was gone. And so at first, my wife and I weren't too worried about it. But as time went on, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and we hadn't seen Chase, we're like, what are we going to do? Like, he didn't have a phone. How are we going to get in contact with him again? Where is he going to be? What's, what's happening to him? Um, and finally, after about 20 minutes and we're inside the ride, I spy Chase call to him. He, he comes over and that's when he says like, that ride was awesome. <laughs> like he had not only made it to the ride, he was the first one there, the first ride of the day in the first car. <laughs> For Chase, that was a peak moment. That's something that he's never going to forget and neither will his dad. And when I tell people this story or I tell people about our trip, I don't talk about the fact that when we first landed in Orlando, I got a text saying our condo was flooded and we didn't have a place to stay. That's not what I remember. I tell them about this moment here, this, this ride with Chase. And psychologists tell us that when we recall events, we don't often sum up all the individual interactions. We use something called the peak end rule. We evaluate our experiences at the most intense moment and at the end. And if we're going to create engaging experiences, we need to create peak moments. Too often I see people delivering products and all they're trying to do is fill the potholes, solve the problems, no delighters, no novel moments. And I got to tell you, those experiences aren't very compelling or engaging. And so we need to build peak moments. We need to transcend the ordinary in order to keep people engaged. I'll leave you with this. Fortnite is a game. Their goal is simply to keep people playing. But you and I, we're designing experiences that are more than that. We're trying to help people get across the finish line, accomplish a goal, do something meaningful. And remember, experiences matter because they shape our lives. In hindsight, when I was working with your Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's uh, customer, I wish I had known these things. I wish I was aware of, of these ideas. But now you are, and the next experience you design might change the world. Thank you. Yeah.